and an encouragement for those listening. We come against fear and anxiety. Lord, strengthen our medical workers and our law enforcement and those who uh, have lost their job, those who uh, have no place to go to work and whose businesses might be failing. God, would you strengthen them this evening? And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. A couple things I wanted to, the reason I want to do this is I was in the book of Psalms uh, for many months, and I was going to continue it, but uh, of course a lot of different things happened. So I just want to kind of share with you what God's putting on my heart through the book of Psalms. As you know, it's an incredible encouragement to those who need encouragement. And the title, it's going to be a brief message. I don't want to keep you late on Wednesday. Uh, We've got a lot of people watching on the East Coast as well. It's 8 o'clock there, 5 o'clock our time. The title, when I get to it, is The Lord Will Hear Your Cry. The Lord Will Hear Your Cry. As a believer or a person who doesn't know God, when you cry out to Him, He will hear that cry, and you can take that to the bank. But I want to talk about a few things that have been coming in uh, from our local church body, uh, from our national ministry, uh, emails, and and asking if I can answer. I can't answer all the questions, um, but we do want to look at some of these. I'm, I'm being asked, what is my view on some of the pastors who are being defiant in light of what's going on and still opening their churches. I know there's a pastor who got arrested. A friend of mine knows him, and and I want to be cordial. I want to be graceful. Um, But I don't view this as a First Amendment right at this particular junction. Here's why. Number one, this is a public health emergency. So as a society, we are called to take certain steps to try to curb the, uh, the effect, infection rate and, and to minimize death, minimize people getting sick. So I think as a church, that's loving your neighbor. You can, you can take those steps that, you know, the six feet and the mask and staying at home. And, you know, we should be setting an example of that. So I don't think this is a First Amendment right um, right now because here's another, here's number two. Uh, this hopefully is short term. We're looking, you know, I know the president said 30 days. Uh, could go a little bit longer here in California and other states, but this is a short-term um, uh, decision that churches are making to comply with the government and help get this under control. And it's not like this administration under the president is against churches and wanting to silence the church. Actually, the president wants to get the voice of the church out there. So you see all these dynamics working working together, and I don't think this is the time to be rebelling against the government orders. Not only that, it sends at number three, I think here, or number four, it damages our witness it damages our witness. It does not send a good message when the churches have a renegade spirit of rebellion and we're, 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 we're sending the wrong message across the landscape. Uh, now, I will say this. I don't necessarily say those pastors have that type of rebellion, but I think our faith can, can get really close to foolishness if we're not careful. I can be this really strong about faith but make some foolish decisions because I'm not taking, um, I'm not considering others. Also, uh, we can still gather together online. Uh, some groups, uh, families are meeting and praying and, you know, at their own home and, and different things. So it's not like the, 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 the voice of the church has been completely silent. Uh, maybe, maybe it'll get to that in the future. I don't know. But I say right now, I don't view this as a First Amendment right where pastors are going to be rebellious and still have church. I, I just don't. That does not resonate with me whatsoever. Number two, uh, I look at those counseling uh, President Trump spiritually. You've got James Robinson. You've got um, Pastor Jack Graham. You, you, got, you have Stephen Strang from Charisma. You have Jack Hibbs, Jim Garlow. Uh, I know all five of those men, and I try to talk to them on a monthly basis if I can. All of those people are saying the same thing. So when you have godly counsel saying that the churches need to abide and respect that decision for now, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. So again, that's, not, that's uh, why I don't agree with churches being defiant in this area. It does, does not send the right message whatsoever. We send a good message when we protect our neighbor and when we get our message out online and then when we come back, we come back powerful. And I believe we're gonna come back. I believe God is using this as a season, a season of pruning. And people are asking, 
Shane, how long is this going to take? What are your thoughts? Of course, no one knows, but the sooner we repent as a nation, the sooner the church repents, the sooner you see broken people, humble people crying out to God, I believe you'll see that plague being lifted even more. It, it's almost like, you know, we're fearful, but not yet humbled. Uh, we're anxious, but we still have our savings account. We're, we haven't been through the furnace of affliction yet, and I'm hoping we don't get there, but we need to cry out to God even now. Also, some questions came in mainly from those reading too much media. Don't look at the media a lot right now. The death rate, they say, could reach 100,000, 200,000, uh, and it could. I'm not denying that, but also I, I checked some medical websites, and the majority of them, warning, they're warning against uh, making predictions. They said there are too many uncertainties. It's almost impossible to draw firm conclusions. So I'm also on my Facebook page, if you're on my Facebook page, the church Facebook page, uh, and I posted a video underneath this live feed that you can show Todd, Todd Starnes uh, with Fox News, a uh, 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 person I've been on a show a few different times. We email back and forth now and then. He took some video of supposedly chaos breaking out in New York at a hospital, and there was no one hardly there. Other videos of, of hospitals and places and uh, where they used a picture that was in Italy, they tried to make that, that hospital appear as it was in New York, and there's a lot of trickery going on by the media right now, so you have to be very careful who you listen to. Now, is there some issues in hospitals? Absolutely. Is there a shortage? Absolutely. Are nurses and doctors putting their lives on the line? Technically, absolutely. There is, there is there's a crisis. It's a pandemic. But... There's a difference when the media is not biased, unbiased, and they are showing the facts versus using this, using the fear to draw people away from whether it's the president, whether they want to crush the economy. We don't really know, but we know, we do know this, that the media, the mainstream media, many cases, is not being uh, straightforward. So how do we know the real death rate mortality numbers? How do we know that this is, I mean, that's the world we live in right now. That's why they call it the fake news. So my thought is be careful. Uh, use wisdom. You know, look, learn a little bit, but turn it off. Spend time with your family. Spend time with God. And we need to not be feeding ourselves on so much of this. Now, I'm preaching to myself right now because I have to go on and do a lot of research. I don't just take a video and say, oh, look what's happening. I, I research it and the mortality rate and different things. And even that, is, it, it feels like it's too much. So those are some of the things I want to cover with our local church and you also that have been emailing us. Um, and I did want to uh, let people know that this is a very stressful time. Uh, it's a, it's a, I, don't, I can't think of a stress, more stressful time for me uh, as far as dealing with church issues, budgeting issues, personnel issues, employees, uh, wanting to keep, you know, staff, and also then dealing with the calls that come in, people we know with the coronavirus, uh, people in the hospital, people, you know, it just, it's a very, uh, and then of course you're in your house with, with kids, and, and you can't go anywhere, and if you do go somewhere, people look at you weird because you're not wearing a mask, or you buy too many groceries, but you have seven people you're feeding, and it's just a very, every place you go is stressful. There, you can feel it. You can cut the tension in the air. Nurses being taxed and, and burdened, and doctors, and then you have those who just found out that they might not be going back to work, and then you have some businesses who are not going to make it very long, and, and you have churches that, you know, can't stay shut down forever, uh, so there, there's just a lot of pressure, but it's a wonderful opportunity to look to God, and I want to encourage you to tune in Sunday. I'm actually talking about that first verse in the book of James, call it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your patience, or testing of your, of your um, all these tests develop your patience, and patience will complete its perfect work in you. Sorry, I know I, I butchered that, I didn't write it down. So tune in for that Sunday, but the Lord will hear your cry. I wanted to just encourage you this evening. The Lord will hear your cry. I was in the first nine chapters of the book of Psalms, and then a lot of things happened. I took a sabbatical. Oh, this is a funny thing. I was meaning to tell you on Sunday, but I might tell you now. I was going. I, I took a quick sabbatical. Uh, didn't even get halfway through, and I was reading some books and websites, and they all said, "Now, when you get off your sabbatical, make sure you don't go right back into work. You got to kind of, you know, just you can't go from 100 mile, zero to 100 miles an hour." And I went from sabbatical to. COVID-19 within one day, flying into Texas and then having to fly home. And, and it was a, a very stressful time. 
uh, but I wasn't able to finish Psalm one or, or, uh, finish the book of Psalm. It could take a while. I don't know how long I'm going to do this. I just know I have something in my heart today. But I want to just, before I go into the next Psalm, I want to recap what we talked about f- a few months ago. And chapters 1 through 9, I'm just going to pull out a few key things. Very first thing out of Psalm, blessed is the man, or you could say woman. The, the word man here is talking about mankind, a person. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Ma- blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. And that's what I just said about the media and where we're getting our information from. And listening, here's what happens. The media or ungodly counsel will begin to speak into your heart, into your mind. You're reading things, watching things you shouldn't be doing. And that ungodly counsel begins to influence you. And as it begins to influence you, you remove yourself from that shelter of blessing and covering that God wants you to stay in. Uh, And also, blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Means he's not a gossip. He's not somebody backbiting and hurting. He doesn't sit in the path of sin. He's He's not going and encouraging sin. But what does he do? What does he do? Blessed is a man who does these things and who meditates on Netflix. Nope. Meditates on voodoo. Nope meditates on the word of God and that's why I'm, I just finished Psalms last month and I'm going to be back in Psalms because during this season I've got to be feeding my spirit you have to learn how to encourage yourself in the faith and not rely on somebody or some person also I want to talk about this I know I talked about the media but also influence right now you're going to be seeing a lot of things coming out or, or, well they've already been coming out I've known a f- about a few of these um, for at least the last year on conspiracy type theories um, and I'm not going to mention names I don't want to give them any more credit but you you know if you're watching what they are and if you watch them uh, some of these conspiracy theories just have one letter uh, in the alphabet I'll, I'll leave it there uh, and I don't know there's a lot of truth behind these things uh, there's a lot of corruption in our government from the pedophiles and from Weinstein and Epstein and his I mean it's just amazing how much is going on and there there's a lot to it but what I'm finding is those who get caught up in this and they watch it all the time and they're looking for these signs and they're looking for this, they begin to foster fear in their own heart and the, and in, and the fear in their family. So my thought is this, is it building you up spiritually? Is it edifying? Put it through the Philippians funnel. Count it, or not, the, not, yeah, the Philippians funnel, I believe it's chapter four, where finally, brethren, whatever things are pure and honest, and noble and upright meditate on these things so when you watch these videos like big brothers against you one world government the illuminati and all these things and look at these signs and they're you know and just be careful be careful because a lot of that i think um you, you'll find shortly if, let's see what happens in april okay but i think a lot of those things you're finding that the enemy is also using that to distract you from your main purpose of serving god with all your heart with all your soul because you're so fearful i I mean that's what it does in me It, it creates this fear and anxiety plus you know who's still on the throne you know who's still in control why do we watch these things and act like the world's falling apart and they're coming to get us when you have to turn your heart over to god and god alone and let him fill you with his spirit that's that's actually who we should be really fearing fear god God fear God so what we find here the first lesson from Psalms is the influence be very careful who is influencing you because also who's influencing you is also influencing your children so we've devoted some time in our family and we're promoting this locally at the church to make a point to get through God's word during the season whether we're in this for a month or whatever begin to read God's word every day talk about what you learned and begin begin to allow that to influence you and if you pull your pull off of the media for a season and then you'll you'll notice that you'll start to experience a lot of peace and a lot of joy because you're being conformed to what God's word says But then as I was reading through Psalm and recapping, I I saw something that we don't have yet. 
I'm hoping we're getting there. But there's a desperation in the voice of the psalmist. There, there's a desperation. There's the blessing of brokenness. And I wish I could teach on that for the, for the whole sermon. The blessing of brokenness. There's something about being broken before God and humble before God and desperate because desperate people do desperate things in a good way. When they're desperate for food, when you're desperate for water, when you're desperate for shelter, but when you're desperate for God, Oh, what a blessing that is. He said in in chapter 3, I believe it was, I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Arise, O Lord, arise, O Lord, defeat my enemies. You are my only strength. My eyes were like rivers of water, and you uphold me. You You put me back up on the pedestal. You saw me through. You are the righteous one, O holy God. And he began to cry out in desperation. And he said that, I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. See, there's a call. There's a cry. Some of you will remember I talked about this, um, those of you who go to Westside Christian Fellowship, is when you hear that cry of your child, you know, know, there's a little whimper out back, and it's like, okay, well, but when you hear that cry— that cry of desperation, Daddy, Daddy, help me. Mommy, Mommy, help me, help me, help me. There's that desperation. You get up, you go out, and you take down that enemy or whatever it is, and you, you lift that child up, and you begin to help that child. Why? Because there's a desperation, and God wants to hear that desperation in our hearts. I truly believe that God does ask the question, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want it, America? Do you want it bad enough to turn off the TV and seek me again with all of your heart? Do you want it bad enough to restructure your church so that the prayer meeting is the priority how bad do you want it america there's a desperation a holy a holy indignation for what is taking place and that drives us to our knees a desperation for our children and our grandchildren and and out of that desperation you begin to really seek god with all your heart with all your strength and the psalmist was clear in this area I mean, there's a difference, and I, 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 a five-minute prayer is fine. A quick little devotional before you go to bed, it's wonderful. But there has to be a, a desperation, and, and that word, des- to be desperate, is nothing else is going to matter. In other words, God, I'm so desperate for you, you're now going to become the priority. You're now going to become the, the focus, focal point of my life. Okay, if I lose my job, see, mo- most people wouldn't, you wouldn't be so stressed out and have so much fear and anxiety and worry if you looked at it this way. Lord, even if I lose my job, if I have no income, you will provide for me. But I'm, I'm desperate. I'm so desperate for you that you're the priority. And then that leads me to the next point, the priority we see in the voice of the psalmist. My voice you shall hear in the morning. My voice you shall hear in the morning. There's a priority that has to take place. What are you doing in your mornings? I've talked about this last week, but many of us wake up and we look at the news. We look at the, the death rate. We look at the, the, the mortality rate. We look at all these things, and there's not a priority. And the psalmist would cry out, my voice you shall hear in the morning. My voice you should hear in the morning. Other writers in the Bible, they, it would say, in, in the morning hour, they would say, in the, watch, the morning watch, Jesus would get up early in the morning. Why? Here's what, because when you get up, your mind will go to that which is your priority. What do you gravitate towards the most? And, and there's a priority, so as we're being influenced the right way, as there's a desperate call going out from our heart, then God becomes the priority, and he's put again back on the front burner. We don't say, we, don't, we say, God, I don't care what happens to the finances, what happens to this in my house or in my job. We begin to say, I want you and nothing but you, and he becomes the priority. And then through those chapters, there is the reward, the reward The psalmist said, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard the voice of my weeping and crying. So there's a reward. You need to know that, kids, if you're watching, watching parents, if you're watching, that we serve a God if you know him, if you have a relationship with him. You have to make sure you don't have religion. Religion is just going through motions. If you, if you belong, here's, here, let me just give you a test. This is off the, off, the, off the sermon notes. If you're trusting in your baptism, 
Let's say you're baptized when you're a young boy or you're baptized or a young girl. Well, I was baptized. Or if you're trusting in a certain religious system. Well, I belong to this organization. I belong to this church. I belong to uh, you name it. If you do that, then you have religion. Or if you say, but I'm a pretty good person. I'm a good person. I do good things. I'm not an evil person. I belong to this. I, I, I was baptized here. And see, it's all these rules or all these regulations. And, and we have to go to confessional. We have to go through this. We have to get, even the Pope, I told you Sunday, just declared, hey, because of coronavirus, you can just go directly to God through Jesus Christ. I want to say I could have told you that 2,000 years ago. That's what the Bible teaches. You don't have to go through man. So if you're trusting in a religious system, You need to repent of that this evening and say, God, I repent. I want to have a relationship with you, not religion. And that's the reward. The reward, the Lord has heard my weeping. So if you are a child of God, God will hear your prayers. Doesn't mean he answers right away. I've learned this lesson the hard way. God hears my prayers, and he says, Shane, I heard you. Just wait. (laughs) Just wait. I want it now. Lord, we need answers now. Just wait. And it's that waiting time that your strength is rebuilt. Now also, though, if you don't know God, the reward, God will hear that cry. There, there, I believe that when a person is in not right relationship with God, he doesn't know God, the only prayer that God is really uh, bound to answer in his word is the prayer that says, God, save me, a sinner. So when a person cries out to God, God will hear their prayer. And let me tell you this, if you're, if you're going through tremendous anxiety, you don't know what's going on next week. Welcome to the club, by the way. And it, you, you're just like, Lord, I don't know. He will give you peace that surpasses all understanding. As you cry out to him, make him the priority. Now, that peace will come in, but then here comes the fear later on, too. It's a battle. Let me tell you, this, A.W. Tozer said, life is a battleground, not a playground. And I didn't know what he meant 20 years ago when I first came back to the Lord and read his book, but I know now, life is a battleground. Every day, you are battling against the, 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 the uh, fruitful works of darkness. We need to expose those unfruitful works of darkness. But here's the good news. Then we do have the assurance. I could take you so many scriptures between Psalm 1 and Psalm chapter 9. The psalmist says, I will both lie down in peace and sleep. Now, he was going through a tremendous difficulty. He had, he had, um, he had, uh, he had rivers of, of water. He'd say, if my eyes were, were rivers, they would be crying out. It reminded me of Jeremiah in the book of Lamentation. I wouldn't recommend reading Lamentation right now <laughs> because he's, he's lamenting, Lamentation's lamenting over the fall of Jerusalem. And as a prophet, he was caught in the middle and he had to suffer with the people. But there was hope even in Lamentations. And I might get to that on Sunday. But the psalmist said, I will lie down in peace and I will go to sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. See, you can lay down in peace. Ultimately, our president is not in control. Did you know that? China cannot do anything more than God says God allows. Russia has no power. Iran has no power. These enemies are not a threat compared to God Almighty. He holds the kings in the palm of his hand. The Bible says he raises one king up and he pulls another king down. That is God Almighty almighty and that's the god we need to serve we need to get our hearts back to that assurance and the psalmist prayed the lord will be my refuge for the oppressed he's a refuge in times of trouble for you lord have not forsaken those who seek you god if you seek him you will find him yes it might mean we get sick it might mean you'll lose your job it might mean things are chaos breaks out but if you seek him you will find him and when you find god that's all you need So we see the influence we have to be careful of, the desperation, the priority, the reward, the assurance. I want to read that again. The Lord will be a refuge for those who are oppressed. He will be a refuge in times of trouble. See, times of trouble are everywhere, and God is that refuge, and he's that that, 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 um, that, that strong tower that you can run to. And then final, finally, I want to say kind of positive, but this final point is a little, 
uh, it, it's a little difficult for some people to hear, but that's okay. Listen, pastors need to get back to saying the difficult things. You want to see America change? You want to get through this COVID-19? You're going to have to get to the wonderful, back to the wonderful truths of repentance and holiness and the justice of God and the, and, the, and the fire of God and the holiness of God, and you see the church revived again. We can't go three points to a powerful financial breakthrough and your, your best life now and 12 steps to recovery and, and all those things might be wonderful i don't know but i know that we need to get back to the old truths of the bible the truths that jesus used to preach he used to say he used to say that man must repent and believe so the last point is the judgment there was a judgment and in psalm the psalmist says the lord abhors the bloodthirsty and the deceitful man the lord upholds i'm sorry abhors that's a strong word the Lord ab ab abhorred. He, he hates the bloodthirsty and deceitful men and women. That's exactly what's happening right now. The bloodthirsty. When, when some of our elected officials can try to push push abortion money into the stimulus bill when you see them rejoicing over the murder of children folks we've got the blood of innocent children on our hands and america needs more intercessors like nehemiah interceding like ezra interceding like daniel saying oh my people we have sinned like jeremiah saying oh god we have sinned get off your high horse and repent and become an intercessor for your nation God abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. God is a just judge, for the righteous God tests the hearts and tests the minds. There is a judgment coming. I don't know how this will all play out. I don't know if this is a judgment of God. I think 40% of all evangelicals in, uh, surveyed said it was. And if you look at Scripture... Uh, you can definitely see that this could be a judgment of God. We have to remember, often when God would judge people throughout the Old Testament, we have 1,500 years of recorded history in the Old Testament, only about, depending on when you think Revelation was written, we only have about 90 years in the New Testament. So you see this, this big uh, uh, section of time in the Old Testament where God's, even godly prophets would have to go through the judgment. Even Daniel was carried away ca captive. Even um, Jeremiah went through the fall of, of Israel. And God said, I sent my messengers to warn my people. I, I, I rose them up early and they sent them, but they scoffed my messengers. They rebuked at my counsel. And the anger of the Lord arose against his own people until there was no remedy. And so you do see that. I don't say that to scare you, but I do tell you to prepare you. I tell you that the judgment hand of God can look like something like this. I don't know if it is. I pray it's not. But in God's judgment, there's mercy. There's, and, and when you cry out to God, there is mercy. I'm going to just leave you with a closing story about the prophet Elijah. Many of you know who he was. He was an Old Testament prophet. And he would prophesy against wicked King Ahab and Jezebel. And it was something interesting. I, I love these guys. I mean, I love I, Elisha, Elijah, uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, uh, Daniel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, and Jonah, and Micah, and Nahum. And my heart beats with them. And, and they, they were just, they would shoot you straight. They would, they would tell the king what the king needed to hear, not what he wanted to hear. So Elijah is calling the people back to God. He, 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 he pronounces a, a um, drought, no rain, and, and Israel is suffering because Elijah pronounced that, that, that great uh, call of God and that, that judgment of God upon the people. And the king had the audacity to say this. He told Elisha, Oh, you troubler of Israel. Oh, you troubler of Israel. And all Elijah was doing was preaching repentance. And see, that's how many people in the media are going to take this type of message. We need to have pastors being called, oh, that troubler of America. Boy, if anybody emails me and says, Shane, you are a troubler of America, I know I'm doing something good for God because you have to up, you have to um, wake up the sleeping church. You have to confront and convict a decaying nation, and you have to call out sin. Oh, you troubler of America. Oh, you troubler of Israel. And we have to get back to that difficult, to the difficult truths, I believe. Because any, no matter what this is, if this is a judgment of God, if this is a 
not a coincidence, but something that is just allowed within his sovereignty. It really doesn't matter what it is. Why? Because the remedy, remedy is always the same. The cure is always the same. Return to God, he says, and I will return to you. Call on me, and I will hear. Seek me, and you will find me. Trouble the whole nation by preaching repentance. And that's, that's what's good. Now, now, now the America's getting closer to wanting to listen. How do you know? Well, I know one mainstream uh, TV outlet just asked a nationally known pastor if he would pray on live TV. And you're hearing, you're hearing uh, different things happen and different people praying now more. And, and we're not there yet to that, that state of brokenness. And I hope God brings revival before we get there. But you have to know that these types of troubling messages on judgment and repentance and the holiness of God, God uses those types of messages to draw us to a much more deeper relationship with him. So that's what I wanted to cover on the first nine chapters of Psalm. I want to recap a lot of what we've already talked about. God willing, I'll, I'll be back next Wednesday. I want to keep doing this as long as I can, uh, as long as we're allowed to. And I want to just, what God's been putting on my heart in the book of Psalm, and then on, on the weekends, uh, just a normal teaching, uh, and really to encourage you, because I think people, we need to stay together, we st need to stay connected, and I believe... I don't know how long this will last. It, it could be 30 days. Uh, it could be a little bit longer, depending on what they're going to watch for. Uh, let me just end with this. I'm not prophetic that I know, of, but I'll, here's what I think they're going to watch for. They're looking for a spike. They're, they're, when, 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 like they saw in China and different places, there's a spike. So you will see the mortality rate increase. You, see, you will see the death rate increase, especially as more people are tested. You go from you know, thousands to tens of thousands more who have it. So obviously there's going to be more deaths because there's more people being tested. So once you see this kind of hit a peak and then begin to go down, that's when <coughs> I believe some of the, the reins will be, be the, the, the tightness, the, the stringency will need to be released because we got to get the churches back to what they do. we got to get back to the way things were and uh, not run out and be foolish. But I believe the economy is vitally important to the health and stability of our nation as well as fighting this virus. So I don't know. I'm praying that God would do a miracle, that God would just... Uh, but some of these governors, interesting, interestingly enough, it's Democratic governors who are not allowing some of this, this proven medication to be used. Um, it's a big word. I don't even know how to pronounce it, so I won't say it. But, you know, they're, they're, they're not allowing that to be used in their, in their states. And so there's a lot of... There's a lot of funny business going on. There's a lot of, of uh, things that just don't look right. And I know there's a spiritual battle going on behind, uh, behind the scene. I, I would say that 2020 is probably going to be the most important election that we have ever seen in our generation. Uh, you're going to be seeing uh, the Democrats calling for um, uh, voting online, uh, not, not going in person. There's a reason behind that. I don't, <coughs> don't want to get to that right now. But a lot has to do with rigging the system and, and a, lot of, um, a lot of tomfoolery. So we just have to be in prayer. And, and I'm going to call things as they are. And we, we need, just need to, um, again, be back in God's word. And, and I'm just going to close in prayer because I'm going I'm to take too many rabbit trails if I don't hurry up and, and stop. So, Lord, we just give you this message. I pray that it would go and it would penetrate the hardest of heart right now. Lord, the abusive husband, God, wake him up. The abusive mom, the angry mom that's hurting her children, the father that's hurting her children, those that are unloving and ungodly and selfish, God, would you use it to convict them? And my prayer is that families would actually come back stronger, stronger by looking to you and looking to your word, and they will come through this even stronger than when they went in. Marriages would be restored. Lord, I can picture, I can picture many marriages even now being restored and being healed. I can, I can picture people, fathers, putting priorities back into the lives of their families, not chasing the almighty dollar, but chasing you. And, and priorities are coming into play. Families are being restored. And, and your word, again, is being elevated. The fear of God is in this land again. So, Lord, my prayer is to accomplish your will, but not let it go beyond what is necessary to lead this nation to repentance. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I think we're going to put a little bit of music back on for those who want to just kind of reflect uh, for the next five or ten minutes or so. This is a great time. If, if, 
you, if you have family there and it's hard, you could do it later, um, but you could have your kids uh, pray with you and just get on your knees in front of the television. That's fine, gosh. That's a priority. That's a desperation. Or hold hands with your spouse and pray, and as we close in worship, just begin to allow these things to, to just uh, penetrate your heart.